Thank you. I, I, my name is Liz Allen. I just told Adam I'm a little nervous about this. I've run meetings before, and I've certainly been on a lot of Zoom calls uh, since the pandemic, but I don't know that I've ever moderated something on Zoom. So, uh, But I want to thank the speakers and Adam and everyone else so far who's already chimed in for making uh, it. It sounds like we're going to have a really comfortable environment here. We're going to hear from two experts and uh, and uh, community people and we're going to take some questions and we're going to have a wrap up just to give you a little bit of background about myself i worked for the most of my life at the erie times news um erie's my hometown um so at, as i worked as a reporter editor lifestyle editor administrative editor um public editor opinion editor so i've kind of been the gamut and I've told, said in a number of forums that my interest in redlining actually goes back to the 1970s after I graduated from Marquette University in Milwaukee. Um, I got a freelance job working for something called the Council on Urban Life, um, which was run by the uh, Catholic Diocese in Milwaukee. It was, uh, they did interesting and um, in, uh, action-oriented reports on social issues. And my project was to write about uh, the first teacher strike in Wisconsin. But my roommate uh, was working there full time. This is in the mid 1970s. And she did a report on redlining in Milwaukee. And I was talking about this earlier today. And I was also mulling it over last night before I went to bed as you know, socially conscious new college graduates, my, my roommate, a number of other friends, we moved from near campus housing to a, a neighborhood where diverse neighborhood where we chose to live there because we wanted ourselves and eventually our spouses and our children to grow up in a diverse neighborhood. And I, even though I knew about redlining in the 1970s from reading this report, it wasn't until last night when I was clicking through some of the information from the you know, University of Richmond, um, looking at stories about how Milwaukee, where I lived for a number of years after I went to college, is still the most segregated city in the country. Um, looking at the, at the images for Erie's redlining maps, that it really hit me that I know that, that this is part of a, a systemic problem, but I realized that those efforts to kind of, you know, the whole good hearted, you know, we're doing the right thing kind of thing to stabilize neighborhoods. Um, we were up against what was going on because of redlining, you know, uh, falling property values. When those friends of mine, we just rented, but when friends bought houses, they bought flats because you could have somebody your tenants to help you pay the mortgage. And then when they wanted to buy single family homes, it was no, really hard bad. to sell the homes. Oh, she's doing it. Um, I think somebody not muted, maybe. Anyhow, so I'm really interested in learning more about the systemic uh, problems that redlining has created. I'm looking forward tonight to hearing from our, our speakers. I just want to go over a little bit of housekeeping. So this is being recorded. So when you aren't speaking, please keep your uh, Zoom on mute. Um, we're going to have uh, questions. We can do it. You know, we could maybe do like the whole raise hand or type questions into the chat and uh, we'll get to as many questions as possible. We've allotted um, at least up to an hour, possibly an hour and a half to be able to get through this. Um, we're going to let our speakers introduce themselves and we're going to start with um, Mindy Fullove, who I didn't realize it's actually been nearly six years since she came to Erie and really... Um, energized the audience at the, I believe it was at the Booker T. Washington Center with um, her outline on public health. So we're gonna have uh, Mindy jump in and then we will have uh, Ken uh, Doino speak, who's from Pittsburgh now, but originally from Buffalo. And we'll, then we'll have, I think, uh, uh, Roland and Adam uh, respond, and then we'll have questions. So. Mindy, you ready to take it away? Did I cover everything, Adam, or did I miss anything? 
No, that's a good intro. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Mindy Fulilove. I'm a professor of urban policy and health at the New School. And I'm a psychiatrist by training, but I study cities. So I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about what is what is redlining and how we might think about it now. And I'm really delighted that Ken Doino of Rothschild Doino Collaborative is going to uh, walk us through, while I talk, he's going to walk us through some of the visuals. So this will keep it exciting. So these are the questions we want to cover. And uh, so the first one is, what is redlining? And so we wanted to just show you a redlining map and get you know really explain the, this program. So the redlining, what we call now call redlining, is a program of the federal government um, under the Homeowners Loan Corporation, where they sent out surveyors to over 200 cities in the United States, and they asked them to fill out a form. And then they rated the neighborhoods according to a whole list of, of criteria that are on the form. Ken, can we show them a, a form, any any form? Absolutely. Uh, what's incredible about the site that Ken is showing you is a, a site created by the University of Virginia um, at Richmond, it, is that this sort of mapping inequality project that they scanned all of the redlining maps and the background documents and linked them online. So you can look at your city and you can see what are the neighborhoods, how are they rated, and you can see the rating documents. So the, the thing about the rating documents is, you know, how did they decide uh, what they were looking for? So they were looking to protect bankers from high-risk loans. This was during the depression. And they thought that the way to do this was to say which parts of the city were worth investing in. And um, Ken is going to make this form bigger, maybe. Let me just get to the. Um, great. So you see the at the top, they're looking at who lives there. And they, they have these sort of two big categories favorable influences and detrimental influences. And you'll notice that concentration of foreign is under detrimental influences. So, so and who are the foreign? They're Italian. Um, and then they also note that there's Negroes and that there's an infiltration of Negroes. So one of the, at the heart of what they're looking at are what the what they language literally called undesirable racial types. And the undesirable racial types, a lot of people, but certainly immigrants, African Americans, Latinos, Asians, were all on, uh, Jews were all on this list of undesirable types. And then they also look at the worth of the housing and the kinds of jobs people have. So then, based on these criteria, they really made a two by two table. So, and and the and then those correspond to the colors. So the two, this white, non-white. Put you, you know, is sort of two categories. And then they also looked at the age of the building, so new or old. And then that gave them four categories. At the top were places with new buildings, white people, and covenants that kept out the undesirable racial elements. Ken, can you show them a green? Oh, let's look at Erie and look at the green. So this is the redlining map of Erie, and you can see a little green spot. Um, and that's where there were white people in new buildings at that time in the 1930s. So the second category was blue. And that had to do with pretty much white, was like definitely white, but the buildings weren't quite as new and they might not have restrictive covenants. So they couldn't necessarily keep out this infiltration of undesirable racial elements. And then the yellow, which is the third category down, is also older buildings and undesirable people and the red is uh, basically undesirable racial elements and old buildings. So that's the, the paradigm is to stratify the city. Now, one of the extraordinary things about this map, can you zoom out a little bit so they can see the pattern of colors? Is that, 
How about that? Let me see if I can get the full map here. Sometimes it's hard to get it to go back to full colors. I never quite understood how to get that to work. But how to get that to work, yeah. It's, it's a little it's, dull. It's gorgeous to walk around in it. Um, so you can see that there are four, the map has four colors. And what you don't see on this map is a red line. Now I'm a psychiatrist, so that kind of like, you know, sleight of hand and giving something a name is always of interest to us. Why would they take a map that has no red lines on it and call it a red lining map? And I, so now we could zoom out to the whole thing, to the whole nation. One of the things that I noticed when I went to the National Archives and studied these maps is that there's basically no, no green in, uh, in the cities of the United States in the 1930s. There is one area that's green in New Jersey and that's Essex County where I live, has a lot of green, but that's because it's a county map, it's not a city map. And the city that's there, which is Newark, New Jersey, has basically no green. Uh, but, and so all the green is out in the, in the areas that are gonna be developed for in suburbanization. And this is important because really what these maps are saying is there's no, there's no place to invest in the American city. Let's go to the suburbs. And so when we say they are redlining maps, what we hide because it focuses on, well, they didn't want to invest in the black neighborhoods, which they didn't, but we lose sight of the fact that they actually didn't want to invest in the American city. And the American cities have tumbled into desuetude since then, um, partly because we drove all investment into the suburbs. So it, it's an extremely important consequence of these redlining maps, what happened. Look at all these cities that were mapped and other cities followed suit. The, the intent was not to help our cities, to make them strong, to keep them strong, but to abandon them. So a second thing about these redlining maps, or, so there are no red lines, it's just a paradigm for economic and social stratification. Um, and they intentionally stop reinvestment in cities throughout the whole country. Now, one of the things about this is you'll often hear people say, because co conversations about redlining are very popular these days. You'll hear people say, well, these areas that were redlined are still fill in the blank. They don't have any trees, they're poor. You can't get a loan there. But it's not true that all the areas that were redlined are still redlined. The, the issue of redlining is that it is a paradigm for where to invest. It's not specific geographic spots that have to say the same. And the dynamics of investment make that very clear. Ken, you were showing that beautifully in Manhattan. Should we show them the Manhattan map, how that? So in the, in the map of Manhattan, you can see that in the 1930s, when there was a lot of industry and a lot of poverty, is big armament industry, a lot of industry in, Man in Manhattan, mix, whole mix of industry, there's lots and lots of red. Now, those red areas that Ken is showing you, uh, don't go up any further, no, go back down, go back down. Like all those areas on the, on the Upper East Side that are red, those are now places where um, a, an apartment, a condo, could cost $100 million or more. So red doesn't, being red doesn't necessarily mean you'll stay red, but the paradigm continues. So money is gonna go to places with the people who are considered white and in buildings that are considered green. So we, we have to be flexible about thinking, what, what does that mean? And, and think of it as a dynamic. What it means is that we don't invest in neighborhoods where poor people or people we have thought of as undesirable, we don't invest in their neighborhoods, we don't invest in their housing. And that's, that's the real problem. It, inherent in this paradigm is that it's very unstable. If you don't invest in old neighborhoods and therefore keep them strong, they're gonna fall apart. And uh, 
Ken once stated this to me as like a law of buildings that you have to keep investing in them constantly. You have to take care of buildings. You can't just abandon them. They'll fall down. And the same for neighborhoods. A neighborhood is a collection of buildings. If you aren't going to invest in the neighborhood, the neighborhood will fall apart. And so that's what's happened all across the country. So if the neighborhood is falling apart and the buildings are falling to pieces, and you're not replacing the buildings, the homes of the poor, then you get what um, is obvious in Erie and everywhere else, you get homelessness. You get a lack of housing that's affordable for people at the bottom of the income distribution. So having said all of this about redlining and showed you some of this on the map, I really invite you to explore all of these resources that are there on this um, inequities website because of the way they went out and mapped these areas and looked for literally what they called undesirable racial elements, you get to read the language of, of racism. People are always wondering like, what is systemic racism? Um, and you can actually literally read it on the forms. So it's a very worthwhile enterprise and will help you understand what we're trying to deal with as we try to undo um, race and class inequities in our country. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ken, who's gonna talk about how do we fix it. And thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Mindy. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that one of the things that you'll also notice in some of those red line maps is there's a lot of white areas which uh, are just un unrated. Those were the commercial and industrial districts. So commercial and industrial districts, they weren't able to characterize by who lived there. Um, and what you see here is, um, just a collection of three books of Mindy's over time. Um, I had the honor of working with Mindy on Urban Alchemy, um, which talked about how we design our way back to recover from the fact that our cities were sorted out. Uh, I think uh, uh, Mindy uh, originally focused on a psychological phenomena that she saw in cities and how uh, tearing up urban neighborhoods were really creating uh, 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 trauma and, and long-term decline for people and, pe and serial displacement was hurting people continuously. Um, in Urban Alchemy, uh, we were able to work with Mindy in understanding ways that we could start to understand uh, uh, both looking backwards and forwards. We, we um, explored the history of what preceded urban renewal and sort of um, primed those urban spaces for the emptiness by virtue of cutting off the flow of capital uh, decades before. Um, and then in urban alchemy, how it is that we can start to restore those communities without displacing people within those. And Mindy's latest book, focusing on main streets, has been about um, understanding how, what the role of main streets are as commerce changes. But in urban alchemy, we talked about the need to align people um, create change and connect a city back to together again. Uh, and we developed a concept of alchemy in this context in that it was too complex to say there was a singular path, but we were trying to create community uh, from things that were stressed and, and traumatized and um, ultimately sorted out um, and, and um, in pain ultimately. Uh, and we recognize that the process of design is one in which we're trying to create uh, a community again in this context and help the community that is there to be a critical part of that. Um, so we created what we called um, elements of urban alchemy. Um, one of the principles or premises of this was that alchemy was uh, the, the process by which um, in the, in the dark ages, there was an effort by, by uh, fiefdoms and kingdoms to try to create gold uh, from various different pieces of uh, material out there. Um, but what came out of that was not gold. Of course, you couldn't construct gold from, uh, from other matter, but what came out of it was the process of chemistry. So we said, let's identify some of those elements that are critical uh, to um, developing and, and creating a whole connected welcoming city. Um, and that in alignment that a community yep, needs to what? work together. Again. 
Yeah, in the city. Um, it, it, it'll go until the election. Oh, is, sorry, if you could mute your phone, if you oh. could mute your, somebody speaking, if you could mute, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so one was setting a table for people to work together as a city and thinking about the whole city, because as Mindy pointed out, redlining was about an entire city. It was about disinvesting in whole cities. Second was, you know, finding what you're for, finding things to advocate for. We have a lot of on focus on negative things, but what we're trying to do is identify ways in which we can make things better through advancing things and then making a mark uh, and making sure that whatever we do, as we try to create uh, the future city and a welcoming city, that we're unslumming neighborhoods, unpuzzling spaces, strengthening the whole region and creating meaningful places. Uh, and then as we create feedback loops to try to show solidarity with everybody, and all life um, and celebrating accomplishments through that. So these were some of the elements explored in Mindy's book, Urban Alchemy. We have been focusing on that because I think in our practice now, which is going into 32 years in practice, we have used a, a, a process by which we've always told stories through which we create our projects. And we've had the honor of working in affordable housing since our inception uh, back in 1988. Uh, and working in affordable and supportive housing and working um, in, in the Mon Valley community of the city of Pittsburgh in the late eighties, uh, it was suffering the decline of the steel industry and a lot of communities that had been sorted out through the redlining process and were in a post-traumatic or current traumatic situation. Um, so what we've done through that is done community planning, telling projects of stories of how to connect and reconnect communities uh, and then creating mechanisms through um, the most recently working on community land trusts, which are models by which affordable housing for sale is developed so that people who are able to purchase those homes are able to develop wealth in neighborhoods that, um, uh, that have uh, uh, already started to be gentrified. So we're securing affordable housing within those contexts. Um, to tell a little bit about those stories, one of the underlying principles is that we have to recognize that design, all of the change that happens is preceded by design. And we can't be neutral in design. It's either going to reinforce or counteract the economic, social, or physical momentum within communities. Um, and the continuity of development, as, as um, Mindy mentioned, is critical. If we stop the flow of capital, communities and buildings and spaces fall apart. Um, and, and redlining, um, as we saw here, was about stopping the flow of capital in all of those cities. You can see how enormous um, hazardous and definitely declining. So if you think about the red and the yellow, nobody would say, I'm gonna move and move toward uh, hazardous situations, or definitely I'm gonna invest in something that's definitely declining. <laughs> um, those are not attractors. Um, and indeed, as we look at those, those forces, we see that there's actually a much more complex picture of what is the diversity. Um, this is when we break out and try to understand how we acknowledge those histories and inequity with, with honesty, we use those statistics in an open manner. So we started our business up in this area of uh, the east end of the city of Pittsburgh um, and the Mon Valley I mentioned, we have communities like Braddock here that had been redlined, and you'd see that in the red line map, um, the industri industry declined all around it uh, and the population plummeted. Um, and that looks like an empty main street when we look at what, what that's turned into. Um, and <clears throat> by the time we started to work in this area, uh, the, po the population in the community looks something like this. You can see no tree coverage, you can see lots of vacant property and vacant homes and missing homes where there used to be homes. This was the community hospital uh, here that was demolished. Um, there was 10% of its population. Um, we can also see that statistically that there becomes a much larger African-American community and that stratification and separation and sorting out by race and class has transpired over the course of time in the cities and churning from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, and then we, we see that also in that population decline. This is, these are those four communities uh, surrounded by those 
the, those uh, four colors there. And you can see the peak population actually started, uh, it, it peaked in the 20s and 30s uh, and 40s and 50s, depending upon which segment of the community, but it is all in decline. And in Braddock, that peak population now uh, is at one uh, tenth, 10% 10 of its peak population uh, and uh, even a little bit less than that when redlining was begun. So that's a, a very vicious process by which disinvestment uh, forces everybody from that. Braddock sought to align its physical conditions through activity to, they acknowledge that history and they wanted to understand how do they make physical change, foster activity and create economic improvements in their Main Street area. Um, and that has been something that we've been working on now for, uh, for uh, probably about uh, uh, maybe a decade, maybe 12 years. Um, and let me sort of show what that vision was uh, first about aligning these areas where they needed activity to work, to live, to, uh, to shop and exchange or to grow, which is where their school and youth services were uh, within the community. And that's this main street now that has senior housing. The hospital site has affordable housing on the hill. This is actually now a new community park. This is a medical services building. And most recently, this building here, which was uh, once the focal point of the shopping district, uh, an, an eight story, believe it or not, furniture store. That was uh, when this was a thriving Main Street in 1930s, this was built as a uh, sort of peak modern era building. And that is actually being restored right now uh, as artist affordable artist housing. Uh, this sign has actually gone back up and this has been restored using the uh, federal low income housing tax credit program to create artist housing that will help to activate and, act and uh, align the community's goals there. That was all done and, and um, preceded by the community saying, we want our main street to be the focal point of the community and to utilize affordable housing and the need to create high quality affordable housing to accomplish some of our community goals. Um, in in the, another segment of Pittsburgh in uh, the north side of the city of Pittsburgh, we've been able to take housing, which often in the 40s and 30s had the least desirable sites on the hillside slopes in between neighborhoods. Um, and this is across from downtown uh, where the, the hills were uh, places that separated the hilltop neighborhoods and the flats. And this is where uh, the sort of bunker housing and affordable housing was done as cul-de-sacs as the least desirable spaces um, we've been working to make those the most desirable spaces, connecting to the fact that this was the location uh, that connected, it actually once had a funicular on it, connected the lower and upper neighborhoods. And we created a, a, a restored mixed income housing that actually serves a broader array of the community and creates comfortable connections from the upper site to the lower site. And that has um, now has a whole range of people living there from a, a range of different class backgrounds and economic capacities. Um, and then those neighborhoods in which uh, the wealth has uh, already taken off. So that's the neighborhood uh, called uh, Lawrenceville. Um, that's a neighborhood in which um, there's already been a lot of gentrification. And you can see that here in this economic bar, for example, you can see that when we divide the population up into quintiles, there's all of these bars to the right where there's this growth and that's an incredible uh, strength of the hot people of higher incomes. So those, but there were still the missing tooth properties within those neighborhoods. And so the community land trust model took those, um, those uh, sites and uh, separated the site that, get, that is maintained in ownership by the community land trust uh, and then for sale housing is built on there. Uh, in those infill sites, the, the housing itself is able to then develop uh, wealth and be sold, but it's sold in a regulated fashion and not flipped to the next person from a development standpoint. Uh, and to do so with uh, high quality design outcomes makes them both more livable and uh, allows them to create value for those individuals that are, are income qualified uh, to, to have that be their first home. 
So the CLTs are, have often now become the first homes for people uh, that have previously only been uh, had uh, rental uh, uh, homes available to them. So um, the, the bottom line, affordable housing, land banks, land trusts, community plans are all vital tools in creating a more sustainable and equitable future. Um, but those are um, all sort of part and parcel of the conditions that preceded us. There is no neutrality in this. We have to figure this out together to create a more sustainable future. And when we go back to, to the 1910s and 1920s, uh, we find that um, those conditions had even started then. This is actually my family from Newcastle. They were banking, they were, uh, the, the foreign banks were run out sometime around the 20s by the big national banks. Uh, and they were all closed down um, to interrupt the flow of capital in the, at that point to the Italians. Um, I'm sure that's happened to many Jewish bankers in that era, as well as, uh, as different other immigrant banks. Um, and if you go look in, uh, at the red line map, this was then redlined as a, a red area. Uh, and, and then if you look what's there now, it's a, it's a really deteriorated urban condition in downtown Newcastle. So these histories go back a long, long way. Um, and we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. Adam, you are up next, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, either Roland or I, but I'm good. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me pull up. I, um, I, I wanted to touch base on what is happening in Erie at this point in time, which uh, I'm going to share a screen here. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay, which screen went up? <laughs> I'm thinking, where are you? Okay, sorry about the delay here. Uh, your screenshot, okay. Uh, you don't have the PowerPoint. You, do you have the Renaissance Center or the PowerPoint? We, we're zoomed in on the logo for Civitas. Okay, that's the one I wanted. All right. So um, <clears throat> let me just do this quick here. All right. Um, so to, whoop, no, no, okay. So yeah, that's the redlining map we were looking at earlier from the 1930s. You're zoomed in, Adam. Yeah, they, is the redlining map up now? Yes, we're looking at the top left corner. Yeah, okay. So yeah, that's that's the map that we were talking about that, that Erie was dealing with. And we kind of got into what it was. Green was good, red was bad. Um, these were some comments. Uh, city Adam, the, the image we are looking at is is a, like one word. Like we see discriminate. You know, like like you're zoomed oh. in too deep. No, Sorry, I see, well, that's, that's, that's I, I not true on all. I see the whole slide. Yeah. So do I. So do I. Okay. I see the whole slide. So uh, there might be some zooming on individual. It's a uh, local problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so these are a couple comments that, that were covered by by Mindy. So th this is the 2015 assessment from Erie, and if we put them side by side, you can see how the red and the yellow translated to all red. Um, you can see how a lot of the blue and the green because of economic forces, they weren't able to hold off the red and the yellow and the orange. It just crept over. Buki said Erie's problem is about 600 million bucks. 
to fix. Um, the city has since actually installed a credentialed planner and they've been doing a lot of uh, data research and digging in. Um, so one of the things I'm going to touch about it are the four decision-making principles Buki suggested, concentrate investments, and examples of that, that uh, I know those of us at, at Bike Erie and Connect Urban Erie would like to see. Um, this is uh, the, the area of the east side and what's noted are a bunch of assets of those neighborhoods. And we'd like to connect them with the east side opportunity corridor. So there's an, an example of an investment that would really help the east side out uh, to, to connect. Uh, another thing is to change the Bayfront Parkway. This uh, rendering from Max Hentosh uh, is showing on the left, the city, on the right, the Bayfront area where everyone wants to get to. And we'd like to change that highway into a people's parkway and convert the bluff into an actual asset instead of a barrier between the city and the Bayfront. So, these are ideas of concentrating investments to establish connections and to get that connectivity to help the city thrive. Uh, protect and leverage assets. Uh, examples of assets are some of the old time local businesses that are still around. Krauss Department Store on Parade Street. They say if you can't find it at Krauss, it doesn't exist. Um, the New York lunch on East Avenue that's been there forever. Um, these people seem to just be so resilient despite the economics around them, their business still is going and thriving and we need to leverage those people and help the properties around them. We have the, the incredibly unique asset of the water. This is a picture just taken the other day at the end of the South Pier with the ice plates floating out of the bay into the lake. Um, you know, it's amazing that we have that. Uh, the Bayfront, this is during one of the Tall Ships festivals. Um, <clears throat> and even local art. This is the graffiti wall that Logistics Plus commissioned local graffiti artists to, to take a panel and, and do that. So celebrating local art. Um, invest in things at the middle class values. Live, work, and play. We, we've got to... Um, migrate to back to the 15 minute neighborhood model where you get home, you park your car and you don't really need to take your car to the mall or a strip plaza. You can, you can shop just within 15 minute walk. Um, those things we have to get back to, to recreating the neighborhood. And finally, reassert Erie's, reassert Erie's pedestrian scale. Um, this is a one of the things the active transportation plan did was identify sidewalk gaps. All those red areas are areas where there, there are no sidewalks. And I can tell you this area right here at 31st and Pennsylvania is where I grew up. Back in the 60s, we had we, the sidewalk ended right at our house right here. And we're here in 2021. And there's still no sidewalks in that area. It's just baffling to me. Um, and also the bike infrastructure that we're pushing at Bike Erie that the active transportation plan is promoting. Um, these are examples of future bike routes that, that city council adopted and, and we at Bike Erie are gonna push heavily for. So my, the point of my talk was just to talk about how important it is to connect um, the different neighborhoods and, and not isolate them, but connect them. So we're all one eerie. Um, this is a nice community gathering we had with Tony Griffin, who came to talk. Uh, and we talked about these issues. Uh, these are experts, and you can see Mindy's one of them, um, that have come to town, told us about these things on making our city better. And then the question is, but who is listening at City Hall? It doesn't seem like anybody is. Um, and so we really need to, need to push that. And, and thank goodness our moderator, Liz, has been one of the champions of doing just that. So and that's why we have her as our moderator today. So that's uh, as much as I wanted to share that, that uh, yes, we've I diagnosed 
a lot of the problem and we are working on the, the, the remedy. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Nolan, or Roland, sorry. That's okay, Adam. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? We can hear you, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so my name is Roland Slade. Uh, I'm a resident of Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, my expertise on this panel is from the perspective of a black man, a working man, a businessman, a family man, and what I like to call a self-taught cultural critic. Though I'm uncredentialed, I've done a lot of thinking about things like this, um, you know, just traveling throughout my life. Um, on, I, I do run a popular uh, social media platform where I talk about many um, issues that are, you know, plaguing us as a community. <clears throat> and um, I also make these video collages. Um, I actually, uh, last year, um, my piece celebrity activist was selected to be in the spring show um, that was um, curated by um, uh, Aruna D'Souza, the author of White Walling, Art, Race and Culture in uh, Three Acts. As a large black man, I've learned how to diffuse situations, people, you know, dealing with me, I guess you would call it white fear. <laughs> so I'm luckily, I'm kind of like a nice guy. So I kind of you know, know how to joke and thus and so and kind of, you know, make everybody kind of calm. Um, as I moved, I'm originally from Pittsburgh and when I moved to Erie, um, I stayed here renting, um, bounced around uh, the city from the east side to the west side. But when I decided to um, purchase a home, um, I, I found this realtor, um, her husband I worked with at the time, but um, so I felt like we kind of, you know, were friends or knew each other, but uh, I continually felt like she was trying to push me into like a bottleneck. And while I'm not from here, I could kind of gauge where the red line areas were at. And I felt like she was trying to pigeonhole me on the, on the east side um, in between 18th and 26th Street. And um, <clears throat> I only had a couple of wants. I wanted a, um, a driveway, maybe a garage, and I wanted the house to be um, up to date, moving ready. And um, she kept showing me these places, but eventually, you know, I stood firm and, and, and she finally showed me something um, south of that. And uh, that's where I'm currently at now. Um, over the years of becoming more and more socially aware, I joined a group called Civitas. Um, I joined at the time that Civitas was fighting to save the big ride viaduct. And, um, you know, uh, it, it just really intrigued me what was going on. I had seen redlining, I guess, but never really put a name to it. Um, so once I got educated, I become, you know, a staunch supporter of, of, of fighting this uh, fight. So um, unfortunately, everybody knows we, we lost that fight. Um, but through that, I, I really got connected with Civitas and Adam and Lisa and um, Erie CPR. Um, now through my research, I've, I've noticed that um, just going back that all the way back to the GI Bill, a lot of blacks had very difficult times getting homes. Um, my fight wasn't that hard. Um, you know, I guess maybe I was blessed, but I did see a lot of people struggling with um, uh, um, variable rates, not being able to get loans. <clears throat> and uh, even when you had pretty decent credit. Um, so then that kind of worked into my life and it really affected me. Um, you know, my, my wife and I, we opened up a hair salon with our own money six years ago. Um, it's over on the West side, it's called So Fancy Hair Salon. And we opened it up with our own money because of fear of not being able to be able to get financing. Um, to open up a business, a business loan, so to speak. So after six years of running a five-star um, salon, we decided to reach out to the bank that we've banked with from day one and tried to get a business loan. And we were declined. And my credit is really good. The, the, the business is very successful, but we, now this is during COVID. So I guess maybe that has something to do with it, but it was very discouraging. And as I looked into other things and 
started to see the landscape, I seen that it is very difficult to for us to get loans. So, you know, I just kind of wanted, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak, um, but just as a regular citizen, I'm noticing a lot of these things um, in the culture as well, um, not just with me, but people around me. So that's kind of all I wanted to, to chime in with, um, and I'll pass it back to Liz. Thanks, Roland. I had a couple of observations and very uh, quick questions, and then we'll get to the audience. I want to talk, uh, thank Dr. Full Love. I think one of the things that you just did for me tonight is um, when you showed how this has been disinvestment in cities across the country. I really think that that kind of leads to uh, what Ken had said. He said, we have to figure, out, figure this out together to create um, you know, change. So I think those two things are important. Even though we're talking about, you know, the the red parts of, of 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 a city, our city, the green, you know, the blue, it affected cities going forward. So that's something that I hadn't thought about before. Uh, Dr. Fullluff said that. So maybe you could expand a little bit on that. And also the idea, I think, Ken, one of the things you said is we have to recognize that all of the change that happens is preceded by design. So I wondered, you know, you have people, you wanna bring people together, but what are, how do you come to agree on design? It's kind of a broad question because maybe we're talking about design of a particular building or a neighborhood. So maybe if our two guest speakers could talk a little bit about how do we come together? How do we, um, tell the story of redlining and then we hope unredlining the city so that we understand that it's it, it affected the entire city. Um, I suspect that it's going to affect the, you know, the suburbs as, you know, sprawl happened there. Um, and then how, how do we get some, some common ground here? And I thought of one other thing because we're talking about Erie all together and I, uh, Ken, you've worked in you know, small communities, Braddock. We know a lot about Braddock because of John Fetterman coming here and telling the story of Braddock so that we, we feel like we can identify with Braddock. You talked about Lawrenceville. Um, you talked about the Mon Valley. So those might be kind of smaller chunks. Is it possible to do this in a, in a whole city? So I, I'm throwing a lot out there, um, but, and I hope I ask good questions and we'll see what you, um, you know, how you'd like to respond and then we'll then we'll take questions from our audience. Sure, thank you, Liz. Um, and Mindy, do you wanna start first or would you like me to respond? I could start because I think the question to me was much simpler. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if redlining is a, a, a stratification, it's a system of stratification, who's the best neighborhood, who's the second best, who's the third best, who's the fourth best, that's what it is. And then it says, send the resources to the best neighborhood. Don't send the resources to the other neighborhoods. So if that's the system that they created. Now they, they put that system on top of segregation that already existed. One of the questions was in, in the chat was who is they? And they is a lot of people. So we know that, that the whole process of segregating America starts with Jim Crow programs in the, in the 1890s. So Baltimore, for example, is a city that very aggressively segregates in the 19, early 1900s. And other cities follow suit. So mayors, city council people, realtors, the realtors associations, and then the, the federal government, the state governments, the local governments are all involved in creating segregation and then applying this, this formal system of stratification in loans and in insurance on top of existing segregation. So the question is, at, this causes a great deal of harm. It churns the population, and it you know, ultimately, may I say, as a psychiatrist, makes people crazy. We don't want to be crazy. We would like to be sane, uh, and we actually have a lot of big problems that we ought to be solving. So we can't actually just keep being crazy. Um, so, the, the the I just hope that you keep at the heart of your conversation that stratifying cities 
stratifying the world, and then sending all the resources to the wealthiest places doesn't solve anybody's problems. The wealthy places can solve their own problems. The poorest places need help. And, and if we're going to have equity and we're going to have uh, cooperation, we have to share the resources more than we are. So, and, and may I just say, uh, Adam, in you know, your discussion of what your plans were, making things that the middle class values, why would you only want things the middle class values? That's not that's not building equity. That's lifting up one group over the other groups. And that kind of will get you into the same kind of problem. Really, if you're going to bring people together, you have to start saying, well, we're going to do it for this group. You have to say, we're, we're going to do it for everybody. And then you have to get people in a room. And as Ken was saying, you have to ask them, what are you for? You have to get the whole city in a room and say, what are you for? I had an experience in a neighborhood in Philadelphia called Eastwick, where there were two groups. They were really at loggerheads. And we gave them an exercise to do on finding what they're for. And it turned out that the two groups had the exact same values. They, they had nice families. They wanted nice neighbors. They wanted community to work together. They had exact same values. And eventually, they realized that they could bury the hatchet and work together for, on behalf of their neighborhood. It was an astounding thing to see. So you have to ask all the people of Erie, what do you value? What do you care about? And then from that, you can start to build togetherness. So uh, I hope that expands a little bit and I can turn it over to Ken. That's very helpful. But before we get to Ken, I just, in terms of what you value and you mentioned Jim Crow, do we also have to be honest and strip away to get to beyond the red line, the other stories of um, exclusion in our community? And I'm sorry, Ken, I didn't mean to, to hold you back, but do we have to kind of bear our souls, you know, uh, roll and talk, that, that's one person's story, but we know we know what's happened in other neighborhoods near, at least I do, I'm 69 years old and I remember, um, and I remember when a, a black family wanted to move into the manor, which was the, you know, the it's in the city of Erie, but it was, looked like suburbia and neighbors objected. Is it incumbent on us to admit what we did wrong how we lived, or should we should we open those wounds? I, I I don't know if that's appropriate to talk about tonight, but maybe if you give us some guides, because you're also a psychologist. So, and then we'll get to Ken. I'm sorry, didn't mean to, to oh, monopolize. No. It's it's okay. Um, I'm a psychiatrist, which is slightly different from psychology. They know a lot of things I don't know, so I just want to stay in my lane here. I'm sorry. Um. um <laughs> Well, you know, the thing is, would you like to have a healthy city? Uh, is that something you're for? If you want to have a healthy city, you have to stop treating people badly. So that's not opening a wound. That's saying, well, we've been treating some people badly, and that's actually not what we're for. Why would you say some people can get loans and some people can't, and it's on the basis of the color of their skin? Why does that make sense? How is that going to help you be healthy? Is there any evidence in the world that Jim Crow makes people makes cities or countries healthy. No, quite the contrary. All the evidence is that Jim Crow makes you unhealthy. So I think you're for a healthy city. Therefore, you have to say, well, we have some things we have to, we don't want to go that direction. We have to go that direction. Um, I think in the in the wake of, of what's happened in the COVID pandemic, um, where we've, we've literally seen how poor and vulnerable and elderly people just died from abandonment and neglect uh, unnecessarily. And how do you turn your back on, a, on uh, after seeing that and say that doesn't exist? It, it does exist. It did happen. It's not healthy. And if we get another pandemic, it, it'll do the same thing, kill even more the poor, the vulnerable, the weak. So and I think if you find what you're for and you ask yourselves, do we want a healthy city? You do have to turn your back on Jim Crow. And it's good to say these are the policies of Jim Crow. Let's go in another direction. And, and you want to question, if you're going to put something forward, like we, what does the middle class value, you want to say, is that, is that getting us away from Jim Crow or is that a new kind of Jim Crow? We can only have the middle class here. I would say that's not such a good proposition. I would, I would vote against that proposition. You could say it better. Thanks. Thank you. And Ken, I'm sorry. I hope, you, I hope we didn't stray too far from the questions I threw into your lap, so. Well, this, there's no wrong questions here. Uh, I think that's, um, one of the things I would say is we have to acknowledge that cities 
are people who are choosing to live in close proximity for both individual and mutual benefit. Um, and cities are also the places that need to serve the breadth of humanity and the breadth of population. People go to cities because there's different resources available, um, because they um, are not um, going to be isolated or be disconnected from the rest of the world. And cities need to be places that foster that connection and foster that connection for all peoples. I mean, the notion of saying that we take portions of our planet and say, this is for some people and this is for other people, we ultimately have a singular planet, one planet, um, that we have to figure out how to share. We have to figure out how we're gonna coexist on this planet or it won't be here for any of us. There is no such thing as isolating ourselves from that. Um, and certainly those of you who live on great bodies of water like that lake, you understand how one condition somewhere affects somebody somewhere else on that lake. Um, we all certainly share that in the inland you know, territories that have been energy centers and, and, and service centers for the rest of the planet and the rest of the country in terms of our air and our, our uh, air, air quality, land quality, um, some of the environmental justice issues. So we have to look at that. We have to acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge the rights and the importance of people who have stayed with those properties and kept them in uh, for the next generation too, that they have um, an important role to play and those buildings are gonna be part of the future and so they're part of the future. So I think we need to be looking backwards and forwards at the same time. And in order to make sure we have a future that is for all, we have to recognize that the past did this sort of sorting out. So the point of doing this type of gathering, I believe, is that we're able to acknowledge all of those realities, all those conditions. We also need to be able to see that when we look forward, there's things that are better for all people as well. The, whether that's the tree-lined streets or the bike trails or honoring historic properties or building new properties um, that service this or not being anxious about mixed income and affordable housing. Those are all things that are assets to a community. Um, we have a lot of those tools. Those tools are underutilized. Um, and particularly for those components that, you know, and I, you, you said you've heard from, you know, Mayor Fetterman, he, he, you know, did a really remarkable thing within the Braddock community at its nadir. He said, we want to welcome people into our community and we want to make sure that the affordable housing is great for our community and for everybody who lives in that. And we wanna make sure our community is great for everybody who lives uh, in that housing. Uh, and we have, um, I think an opportunity uh, because of those resources being available because uh, we can see with, with clarity that um, different communities have, um, have um, been in different positions in relation to that history. But we can acknowledge that the African-American community in particular in this country has had um, 400 years of having a lot of uh, the deck stacked uh, against their favor. Um, and when we acknowledge that, we can start to correct and address those issues more forthrightly. Um, that's a challenge we all face. Thank you so much. I'm going to look in the chat and we'll see hey, what questions Liz. have popped up there. Pardon me? Liz, can I, this is rolling it. Uh, can I chime okay. in um, real quick before you go to the the question. Sure. So the, the way that um, Dr. Bendy and Ken laid out that foundation <clears throat> was awesome. And I think it's what we can exactly hope for. Yet in practice, we like from an observational standpoint, what I see, and I'm not going to call, you know, Erie, the rest of the, the, the nation, because one thing we know about Erie is we're always behind, right? We're two or three years behind what everybody else is doing. <clears throat> so let's just look at the way things work here. And I don't think that whites in this city or the mortal enemy, it's not that. It's not a black against white type of deal, right? I said this last night on a panel I was on. It's the system. It's the system that's set up to make certain decisions. So while you can have a few like, the great people in this in this in this room here who understand what's going on if we don't put the people that's more at the lower end of the spectrum your people of color um women people of low income if we don't put those people in power to be able to be at the table 
not just as a lawn ornament, but to be able to make decisions, these things aren't going to get done. So let's take the, the Bayfront, for instance, real quick. The people who are in position to make decisions, our, our objectives aren't aligned. So in a perfect world that, you know, that one particular community who were at odds, they came together and they were, oh, they had the same wants and needs. But that's not true of our city. The people who live in other communities drive into our cities and make decisions for the people who are in the city. So from an observational standpoint, until we break up the system and allow us to make bigger decision, decisions for the many, you're always going to have the cream at the top, always making a decision for the people at the bottom. And we have to deal with their decisions. We've seen that for the past 20 years of decision making. And I'm sure Liz can attest to that. Yes, I can. So, all right. So, okay, we have some suggestions here about um, Mindy's books. Um, well, let me see what else is in here. Uh, we have um, for Ken. This question is for Ken. As a policy perspective, since this relates to organizations like banks, housing associations, and past legality, what are the ways we can apply the changes for resource distribution that will direct our attention to what these communities need? Let me see. Uh, in other words, what tools or policies did you find most valuable to equalizing the stratification of red line communities? I think that's a question that could go to both Ken and Mindy. So what tools and policies uh, helped? Is de-stratify a word? I, I don't know, but yes, I guess rectifying <laughs> stratification. Yeah, and in fact, in some ways, we almost need to anti-stratify, even go further than just undoing something, but to actually counteract it, we need to be even more strong in that context. But there are a lot of tools and the tools are, are developing at different rates. They have been developing, and we have to figure out how to make sure we can utilize them for good. Um, those tools, you know, range from uh, from uh, the affordable housing, the the Community Reinvestment Act, um, the the um, land banks uh, has been is only just 2012 or so that allows. Um, uh, entities, government entities to create entities that can take the, the land and use that towards reuse. The, but the land bank is a, is a community entity that needs to have <coughs> community control and commitment to doing good with it. Uh, land bank can clear those properties and put up um, fast food drive through or whatever else they see as being sort of economically beneficial too. So we need to make sure how we take that land banks and start to move that towards affordability and wealth development through housing, for example. Um, the, the, um, in Massachusetts, they've made a very interesting state law, which takes, uh, uh, gives a, a sort of incentivizes private development to include affordable housing and market rate development. It's called the 40B program. Uh, and we've been using, we've been working with some of our clients who are, are, who do what I would consider affordable market rate housing. And they said, well, because we can get the density of our development here in this setting, um, we can help the town achieve their affordable income and affordable housing goals. Um, and the, this Commonwealth in that particular instance of Massachusetts let everybody know if everybody had an appropriate share of affordable housing, every community, this is where your community stands. And so then they let the communities deal with that reality. And many communities said, well, okay, let's figure this out. And since there are programs available and, and incentives available, there are many communities that looked at that as an opportunity to develop properties that were otherwise more difficult to develop, that weren't attracting development. Um, and, uh, and indeed, we've been able to be involved with some of those. Um, the the LIHTX, as uh, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman has shown, can be extremely effective and turning around and saying, we're not going to continue to decline. We're going to make affordable housing uh, uh, the sort of standard by which we, sit, we show that we have a vision for the future. And that has fostered a lot of reinvestment 
in individual homes that otherwise people wouldn't have purchased and reinvested in. Um, so we have to start a sort of virtuous upward spiral uh, through positive action and making that type of change and utilizing the tools that are there. And then we also need to improve the policies, the resources, the mechanisms for those tools that are proven to work. Um, uh, and then lastly, I would say communities need to uh, be clear about their intent for communities to be um, sort of principle and purpose driven in this regard in terms of being for all the citizens. Dr. Fulalov, I wondered if you could talk a little bit to um, uh, Roland's comment about having people at the table who can have a voice that, uh, and I'm from Erie, but I've lived other places, but I've been back here for a long time. And I do know that it tends to be the same power structure, at least on city council, we've tried to address that by doing a better job in um, opening up volunteer positions on boards and authorities. But how do we, do you have some suggestions about not just listening to those voices, but making sure that they are being listened to. Um, I also see we have a question here. You know, there are these, um, you know, either nonprofits or, um, you know, business type groups that have, and to be clear, I think they've stepped into the breach to help do some positive things. Um, you know, what can we do? How can we invest? You know, we're going to make a commitment, but they aren't necessarily those groups aren't necessarily being um, operated by people who, you know, would kind of live downtown or or in the, you know, they're they're more from, you know, the wealthier neighborhoods or outside the city core. How how do we get those voices? I want to say not just to be heard because we have had, we've had conflict. We've heard voices and then you know we get to loggerheads. So. Um, f from your expertise, how do we listen and share that power? <laughs> it's an important question in the, in the United States right now. And I think that um, the, um, the, the key is the, the, you know, if you think about what's going on in the United States, the whole country's at loggerheads. So we're not actually, everybody's yelling at everybody. So how did a whole country get to be yelling, <laughs> right? Um, so we have to, part of it is how does the whole country stop yelling? And just to switch it a little, I wanna just talk about the fact that I, in the next couple of months, maybe, maybe two months, four months, six months soon, this pandemic is gonna recede, we, we hope. And with any luck at all, there won't be a new mutation that sweeps the globe and takes us all, makes us all sick again, in spite of our vaccinations. When that happens, we're gonna be, as you know, was already mentioned, facing an eviction crisis. We're gonna be facing the loss of a lot of jobs of low-income people, a lot of jobs disappeared. We're gonna be facing main streets that are in trouble. A lot of problems, that, a lot of kids who fell behind in school a lot of women who are home with the kids and how to manage work and kids and are really depressed or upset or anxious. So if, if uh, you thought of it as like, wait, our whole nation had just had a heart attack. And after a heart attack, you know that you go to cardiac rehab. One of the things is that we have to think about is how are we gonna rehab the anxious mothers, the educationally behind school kids, the nurses who've been burned out by managing too many very sick patients and watching so many people die. A lot of distress in our nation right now, which is partly why people are yelling at each other. So one of the things to think about is in terms of finding what you're for and starting to create a productive dialogue is what can your group do to help the city through the rehab? What, what are the kinds of things that are gonna be on your plate that you ought to be taking care of or helping to voice. Um, 
in terms of in, in every dimension of life, in the educational dimension, the physical dimension. Think about old people who've been homebound during this period who, have, who need physical conditioning. They just haven't been going out for walks as they should and they've lost strength. Um, so if you think of the, all of these dimensions, we're gonna, we have issues at this point that we have to fix. And so rather than worry about how we're fighting with each other, perhaps we could say, let's cooperate to, to rehab our city. Let, let's get out of this because it's time limited, but it's urgent. You can't do cardiac rehab five years after your heart attack. You have to do it in the six months to, you have to do it right after your heart attack. You have to take care of your diet and your lifestyle. So we're gonna be coming out of this thing, which is as serious as a heart attack. And we have to get ourselves back in shape in all kinds of ways. So I, I think if, if, we, if you can shift your vision a little bit from the ways in which the issues you've been fighting over, the things you won, the things you lost, to say, wait, all of us are actually in trouble. Where are the resources? How do we build? How do we have a good time? And that kind of rehab can actually be fun. So people go to cardiac rehab. And typically, if you have a heart attack, you're a little bit overweight, you've been eating badly, you've been smoking, whatever it is. But if you stop smoking, if you start exercising, you eat green vegetables, you start to feel better. And you know, you go walking with, you know, you go with a whole bunch of people, you make new friends. So cardiac rehab or even rehab from alcoholism or rehab from what Tiger Woods is going to go through in rehab. Rehab can be a lot of fun. So you could make it fun and joyous and collective and, you know, all of Erie, helping all of Erie to feel better. So I just want to put that out there is because we are in a crisis right now. And then how do we, how do we get out of that? How do we help ourselves? We have to heal ourselves. Kind of, it's very urgent. So perhaps that's a helpful way to see how do we build bridges across communities? We, we heal ourselves from this terrible pandemic. What a great analogy. And I will tell you, having been through cardiac rehab, even though I did not smoke and I was not overweight, uh, that was the shock of my life to have a heart attack three years ago in April. But those words that you use, fun, uh, joyous and collective, cardiac rehab i forget i think the insurance approved you know 36 sessions and when i was done it was i was sad to leave those people because we're on our you know our bike together or you know we're doing the treadmill together and i did keep that up after i left so what a positive way to view this and i think it also gets to i think we've had some i think there will be some positive takeaways from the pandemic, um, you know, as you, instead of social distance walking, we'll be able to walk together again. Um, in terms of um, tools be, uh, that someone had asked about and can um, address that, you talked about the land bank. One of the things I can say as a member of um, city council and going to a lot of Zoom meetings we now have a better tools for the public to be able to attend the land bank meeting. Um, and there's always time for public comment at these meetings. So educating ourselves, you know, the city land bank is still finding its way, but um, we can make sure that people know about the formal ways to have voice, but then also um, the informal ways that we can come together. Um, I think, I will, I will take that away tonight with the idea that we, we've been through a heart trauma and uh, we're gonna have, we are going to have rehab. Is there any, how about some other people who would like to ask a question? Um, you can do it in the chat or if I see your face on here, you wanna just, you could physically raise your hand, you can use the hand button. Any other questions tonight? Adam. <laughs> Liz, can I connect something here? Um, I'd like to connect a couple things that kind of passed under the bridge here. Um, one was uh, when, when Mindy made the observation about Buki's plan citing middle-class values and that's abandoning those that aren't middle-class. Um, it, was, it was an interesting observation because I think the assumption for the plan was that everyone wants to have at least a middle-class level life. 
And maybe that's not a good assumption to make, to say this is what, every, that, what the city should aspire to for every neighborhood. So I, I like that she said, maybe you should retitle that because live, work, play doesn't know a class. Um, and maybe it was Buki's mistake to, to label it that way. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting was in the chat when uh, Jasmine Flores mentioned that, um, well, today may not necessarily be racially or minority motivated to segregate people out. It, it, there are certainly instances in Erie where it's just simply your low economic. They don't care what race you are. If you're low economic, they're looking elsewhere. And I think there's an attitude that, that may be hurting Erie, which is that when Buki said, hey, you need to leverage what you have to invest, to invest in the good parts to make them better. And it's like, well, no, not really. <laughs> we need to invest everywhere where we can make anything better. Um, so, you know, that, that gets back to your question, Liz, about voices and tools. You know, as a designer, and Ken, I'd, I'd like uh, a comment from you on this. As a designer, when people say, well, well, let the people in the neighborhood design their neighborhood, I'm kind of like, well, what I think the designer needs is not to totally abdicate the duty of designing that way, but rather absorb completely the experiential data that the neighborhood gives you. And as a designer, we should take that data. What are their good things? What are their bad things? What can we remedy for them? And focus the design on that data. So we're not really asking them as much to design it as we are maybe to program it. Ken, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I think to be engaged and to have their own um, spirits and interests reflected in the outcomes is really a key. Um, and there has to be pathways for that. Um, there has to be an openness towards that. Um, but uh, design can be an engaging process. It, it is also a technical process. So there's certain things that do get left to um, bring the expertise of, of various people, whether they be engineers or architects or environmental um, landscape architects. There's a lot of systems at play in a city that need to be improved at this, particularly at this point in time. Um, we often sort those out and say, well, what are the, what's the highway plan? What's the transportation plan? But um, you know, what's, the, uh, what's the infrastructure plan for the sewers? Um, but we all know that all those systems are interconnected in this city and design is about, uh, if there's a design that says we're just going to you know, plan the water system and it's going to also just by chance tear up the road, in reality, you are doing more than um, doing just the water system. You're also interacting with the road. That's the opportunity to say, what other systems do we need to improve at the same time? What are the ways in which we need to find um, the, the, the opportunities and leverage those opportunities uh, to get a better outcome for everybody? Um, and, and that's what design is. It's about bringing those different forces together in a positive, for a positive outcome. Um, I will say that the other thing that design is about is, is it's about change and change makes people nervous. So when we you know, see that anxiety, often it's placed on the design, but it often has to do with just anxiety and distrust that's been formulated through all of these histories. So by acknowledging these histories, we can start to address those very issues that sometimes prevent us from making those changes too. Um, so, because a lot of change has been uh, done a disservice to people by, by displacing them, by reducing their quality of life, by diminishing um, or by favoring transportation systems over sidewalks. Um, you know, there, there's a lot that gets diminished through that historically. So that distrust has to be addressed in, in a forthright manner. Yeah. And are there any examples of um, when you talked about change making people nervous, it immediately brought some things to mind. I, I'm with my city council hat on. Were there any communities you worked in where there was very strong resistance to change that you were able to? I guess what are some what are some again we're going to talk about tools about making sure 
we, all of us are listening to those anxieties about change because that was like a light bulb moment for me when you just mentioned that. Something that, um, you know, we can be so eager to move forward that I, I know I've done it. I have attributed some opposition to something that maybe would just be anxiety about change. So ha do you have some examples of, um, I, you also told us to celebrate our successes. So maybe kind of tie those two together. Have there been some examples where there was, you know, resistance to change, but you were able to listen and then celebrate a success? Well, I would say that design is always a thick enough process that there's probably not a single project that does not involve that, <laughs> those issues to some degree. Um, and, uh, but I would say that, um, let me think about some particulars. I mean, we, we see resistance when people have different interests um, and oftentimes those interests have to do with uh, sort of narrowing in on something, um, whether that be a, a historic building or the ease with which it, their own interests are being served financially or um, uh, fear of people of different classes. Um, that's a particular one. Uh, I was talking about um, people who are, who are, uh, are working but are, are working poor often feel threatened by people who may be getting other subsidies that that they will fall into, you know, quote unquote, last place. And that's a real anxiety. You see a lot of resistance in working and trying to help elevate communities um, that are, uh, you know, that have suffered a lot. Um, but you see fear that somebody's going to get more um, and, and get an improvement that I don't get. Um, and so one of the things that we're constantly trying to articulate is how it is that properties, if they're um, developed appropriately discreetly within the context of the boundaries of the property, they're also shedding positive energy outside of that property. So one example of that um, is when doing multifamily housing in a community, the, the light uh, in corridors or in gathering spaces that sometimes stays on or stays on to uh, even a diminished light level at, uh, all night long, that brings energy back out to the street and that brings illumination. So all of a sudden a street that is dark has some lights on, on it and you see people. So the transparency and illumination can be an asset in which a, a house or a building shares its energy outward to the street in a way that creates a better street. Um, we've um, had the opportunity to make sure that some of the histories and sites uh, uh, that, that people are afraid of losing touch with that history, that they have a manifestation through artwork, through community integrated art, through um, engagement of gathering that information and then having that become part of the building in some way, shape or form. Um, we uh, have tried to tell the story. So one project that Mindy talks about in Urban Alchemy is this site uh, for the legacy, which is called the Legacy in the Hill District, set between two very famous jazz clubs, historically, neither of which were functioning, um, uh, but that history was going to be lost. So we ended up doing a poll of the uh, neighborhood of who were the greatest jazz greats um, that played in the neighborhood. And then we did a stone entablature wrapping around the building uh, that had all the names of, uh, of all of these jazz greats that had either come from, played in the neighborhood, had some history, and it connected those two corners where those two jazz clubs uh, had been historically the sort of focal point in the thriving area of the community. And, um, you know, you, you, there were some of the gentlemen, one gentleman who was there being honored in that stone said, I never thought I'd be, you know, here in my community seeing my work honored in this way, you know, very touched and very moved by having his history have a place in the future. We're, we have about, I believe, five or six minutes left before we want to wrap up. Um, Dr. Fololove, do you have any closing comments? And are there any other light bulb moments out there? I just love that last idea because we do struggle with what do we preserve? What, what can we not preserve? 
there's different ways of preserving those legacies of telling those stories. And uh, I don't know, I've had so many light bulb moments, I might not be able to get to sleep tonight. But Dr. Fullov, <laughs> any closing comments? And if anybody else um, has some other um, questions you'd like to direct to our panelists, can you put them in the chat? Or not everybody is showing up on video, so I don't see hands. So, If you have any more questions, it's too late. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, thanks, Liz, for the, I, I want to go back to your question about uh, celebrating accomplishments. I, everybody on this call knows that this is really hard work and it takes a long time. And so that's why in the elements of urban restoration, we made one of the elements celebrate your accomplishments. And, you know, especially you all worked, or I don't know all of you, but I know uh, Lisa and Adam, uh, others worked so hard to preserve that bridge, which was knocked down. And defeats like that are, uh, they, they wear you out. You're like, wait, how could they do that? Um, so on the other hand, the things that you, that you win, however small, even being able to hold a forum like this, you have to pause a little bit and say, we had a great forum last night. And Liz, you know, you might list your light bulb moments and just send an email to everybody and just celebrate that, you know, so many things came up that were helpful to you. That's a that's an accomplishment, I think. And so in in the work that I do in Orange, New Jersey, which is my hometown, you know, it's really tough work, like the work you're doing. And so we have more setbacks than than wins at the bigger scale, but we really try to enjoy everything that goes our way. So that's my last closing thought on, in response. Adam, do we have a listserv of people who participated or how would we how would we do that? Is that are we able, able to do that to um, I know we had a working uh, email list of, of who was involved in the planning, but um, it would be I, I know that a lot I recognize names on here, but I, there's other people I don't know. Is there a way to, um, you know, create you know, what's next with this particular group or should we ask them to opt in? I believe that now is when we let people know about the website for uh, Unredline the city. It's um, who wants to take that charge and let people know where to uh, get more information and see this beautiful website and Facebook uh, designs that are going to about, I think they've already debuted or they're going to be ready. So Adam, you wanna, you wanna talk about that? Or Lisa? Actually, uh, I believe there's somebody here from the Scripps Project, and they are um, handling the finances for the organization. So, okay, so we'll turn it over. Is Janelle here? Janelle couldn't make it, but another one of the people from the Scripps Project, the, the nonprofit that's overseeing okay. the new organization. Um, so, who should we, who is that, and how do we call on that person? You know, I'm, I'm looking in the line here. And I'm not seeing them. Maybe, maybe they had to leave. Um, okay. But maybe I'll, if you no, visit Civitas uh, on Facebook, you'll find all this information. Or Adam, do you have that information to share? Yeah, Sarah, Sarah Bennett just posted the Facebook link that you can then link to the, the event and the group. So anybody, you can have that in the, in the chat. Mm -hmm. And then also... Um, this is being recorded, so we, we know a lot of the people on here and we have their emails. There are some I don't know that maybe someone else will, but um, we can harvest a lot right off the recording on people we know that, that we can create a list for. I think we're about ready to wrap up. Am I good? This is always the awkward part of a Zoom when you wave and then you click that talk about red click that red button leave the meeting so did we leave anything unsaid liz I just, another... found the, I just found the uh website it's um okay. eriewee.org there it is okay Five and i i just want to thank uh ken and mindy adam roland um everybody who took uh an hour and a half out of your night tonight to participate Thank you so much. I hope we can all stay in touch. And um, we have, a, I think, a, a list of reading material too, if you haven't read Mindy's books. Um, and we also had a, a suggestion to read uh, um, 
who move my cheese. So we, we have our homework ahead of us. Yeah, so. th thank you Liz for moderating. Uh, Freda put a lot of things in the chat about the, the organizations that influence things in Erie, but don't really listen to people in Erie. And Freda, you have your hand up. Is there something quick you wanted to say before we sign off? Well, just the concern I had that we seem to have, the city seems to have given over control over Perry Square and downtown to two organizations. It's the same organization that basically there are people who don't live in, many of them don't live in the city. And in the case of the Perry Square Alliance, don't even allow people to attend their meetings. And how, how have we let that happen? Yeah, that's a good example of Liz's question about the voices. How, how do they get heard? <laughs> yeah, good point, Freda. Also good point on the active transportation plan and, and missing sidewalks that are in disrepair. <laughs> All right. Okay. Liz. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Liz. Bye. You did a wonderful thank job. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Liz, thank you. Lisa, thank you. Thank you, Lisa.